Revelation chapter number 6. Now we're continuing down through this passage and we'll uh, pick up tonight with the fourth seal. We said a few things about it last time, but I, I want to spend a little time with the details of it tonight. Verse number 7. Again, these are the four seals. The first four seals are the four, are the four horsemen, uh, the, the famous four horsemen of the apocalypse. The apocalypse, of course, is another name for uh, the revelation. So not, you, when you don't translate the word, that's what it is. And the, these four horsemen are the Antichrist riding each one of the horses, and it describes different stages and phases of his career. And ver verse number 7, when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and he, his name that sat on him was Death, and hell followed with him. And power was given unto him over the fourth part of the earth to kill with the sword, and with hunger, and with death, and with the beast of the earth. Now that, that fourth seal is, is, a, uh, is the culmination. And when you have death and hell on top of it, uh, the fourth horse's name, the guy's name that sits on him is death, and hell follows him. Now that's the Antichrist. And the, the issue there about death and hell, you notice that, if you'll notice back in chapter 1, verse number uh, 18, uh, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, amen, and have the keys of hell and of death. In other words, Jesus Christ can take a man out of out of the, 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 his soul, out of, out of hell, and out through death in the resurrection. But you notice in Revelation chapter 6, here's a guy that takes people, it's, the order is not hell and death, it's death and hell, the opposite order. One, Christ reaches down into, into, into to, to hell and takes people out of there through death into resurrection. Here, you have, you have a man whose name is death, He's going to kill them, and the destination that they're going to wind up in is hell. So this is exactly the opposite in every, in every way of the Lord Jesus Christ, although death and hell are in both of them, hell and death in one, death and hell in the other. And again, the Antichrist is a, is a counterfeit. He's counterfeiting the things that the Lord Jesus Christ accomplishes in truth. Now, you notice in, in Revelation 6, 8 that death and hell ha are capitalized. That is, this man is the personification of death, and the personification of hell is what follows him. And that, that's very important to, to understand that. Um, this guy's name is Death, and that's who he was. Um, the name of him that sat on the horse on him was Death, and hell followed with him. Uh, he's a personification of death. Um, Come with me to Revelation chapter number 9, if you will, and Revelation chapter 11. Come over to chapter 11 first, Revelation 11, talking about the beast. Revelation 11, verse 7, when they, have, when they shall have finished their testimony, talking about the two witnesses, Moses and Elijah, the beast, notice, that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war with them and shall overcome them and kill them. Notice where the beast is said to have come from. He comes out of the bottomless pit. That is, this guy is, is, a, is more than just a human. The Antichrist goes through his career, but he's, he's supernaturally empowered by satanic forces that come up out of the bottomless pit and come up and, and, and uh, empower and energize his ministry uh, directly. Come over to chapter 13. Chapter 13, verse 1. And I saw upon the sand of the sea, and uh, stood upon the sand of the sea, and saw a beast rise out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his head the name of blasphemy. This will be the Antichrist now. And the beast that I saw was like unto a leopard. Now you get the idea. The beast is a leopard. He's like a leopard. His feet were as the feet of a bear. 
In other words, his movement, the way he walked, was, his feet were like a bear's feet. His body is the body of a leopard. His feet are the feet of a bear. And his mouth, the mouth of a lion. The dragon, that's Satan, gave him his power and his seat, that is his position of, authority, of, of reigning, and great authority. And so on, we'll study that passage in some detail when we get there. But this beast, the Antichrist, is a composite beast. He's not just one beast, but he's a leopard that has feet like a bear and a mouth like a lion. And you'll see those three animals connected together several times. When we get over here, we'll study back in the Old Testament and the prophets where that, those three beasts are put together often as in connection with the ministry and the activity of the Antichrist. So, so when you come over to Revelation 6, 8, when he's, he, his name is death and hell follows with him, this composite of these things are going together. And that's the way the Antichrist is. The Antichrist is the behemoth over there in, in Job, that, that, that composite. He's a lot of these, these different beasts stuck together in one. And of course it says he's as a leopard, as the bear, as the, the lion. There, he, 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 he's, these things illustrate the, the different aspects of his uh, diabolical career. Now come with me to chapter 9. Is it just me or is it just noisy in here tonight? That's, just, that's not just me, is it? No, that's just not the kid. I, it, was, it was an airplane going over? I, I, I don't know if it's just my ears ringing or what, but I, <laughs> I'm just, uh, yeah, maybe that's, maybe that's what it is. Yeah, the air conditioner going, isn't it? The air show. Okay, all right, I got you. I just, sometimes I'm not real sure if it's just me sometimes. My ears are ringing. They go, like that, you know, and I can, sometimes I, I can tell what's happening, sometimes I can't. But anyway, I don't bother me if it don't bother you. Probably bothers you more than it does me because you've got to sit out there and listen to it. Uh, I, don't, I don't hear much of it. I get caught in what I'm doing. Uh, that's got nothing to do with anything. Revel that, that makes real nice commentary on these tapes that go out. You know, people must think we're nuts. You know, they watch us and I'll stop and just talk to you about something and there goes the message, you know, right out the window. <laughs> Revelation 9, verse 11. Now, in Revelation 9, we'll start in verse 1. The fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven upon the earth, and, him that, and to him was given the key to the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there rose a smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace. And uh, the sun and the air were, dark, uh, were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the great furnace locusts upon the earth, and, and, upon, and unto them were given power as the scorpions of the earth had power. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt uh, the grass of the earth, nor, neither any of the uh, green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which had no seal, had, had, have not the seal of God in their forehead. Notice that these, these creatures, like locusts, come out of this bottomless pit when the bottomless pit is open. And we'll, when we study that, we'll see what, where these demonic creatures come from, what they are. But they come up out as demons coming up out of the bottomless pit. And like I said, when we get there, we'll study why they're there and that kind of thing. But there are these demons coming out of the bottomless pit, and they're like scorpions. That is, they have this, this capacity to, 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 to sting and to destroy and to hurt men. And they go out, and their, 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 their job is to, uh, is to hurt people in the earth and, and, and to bring pain and suffering and agony on those, on everybody except those that have the seal of God in their forehead. That's that 144,000, that remnant in Israel that have God's seal in their forehead and the people that in Israel that are the saints the believers in Israel. We get over there in Revelation chapter 6. Come back, oh, hold your hand here in Revelation, come back to chapter 6, verse 8. Uh, he sees the name of the man, he's, he sits on him, is death and hell followed after him. The bottomless pit opens up and the inhabitants of the bottomless pit follow up. When this Antichrist comes in his ministry, he's death. We'll see that in a minute. He's the personification of death and hell follows him. Revelation 9, you got in Revelation 11, the Antichrist is the beast that descends out of the bottomless pit. In Revelation 9, he, he, you see this angel falling and the bottomless pit is open and all these satanic hosts, hordes come out and they go out to hurt the earth. Hell follows after him. You understand the bottomless pit is, is one of the compartments of hell. 
And power was given unto them, that is, death and hell, over the fourth part of the earth to kill with the sword and with hunger and with death and with the beast of the feet of the earth. These scorpion-like creatures come out and they go out and in Revelation 9 they can't kill it. They don't kill anybody. They hurt. They sting. But you'll notice in verse 5, uh, Revelation 9, 5, to them it was given that they should not kill, uh, uh, that they should not kill them, but that they should torment them five months. And their torment was as the torment of, uh, of a scorpion when he striketh a man. These, these scorpions, like demons, come out there and they, they, they inflict pain and agony and men want to die under the agony of it, but they can't. What's that a picture of? Where do you know somebody wants to die and can't die? Where they're tormented day and night, but they never die. You know any place like that? Hell. These guys are giving them a foretaste of hell on earth. You, you've heard people say, oh, it's just, you know, this, this is hell. I'm having hell on earth. That's what these guys are getting, literally. They're having the, the agony and the, the sting and the, and the suffering and the venom of what sin does and, uh, attack their body by the demonic activity and they're suffering, but they can't die. They look for death. Verse, not, verse 6, And in those death days shall men seek death and shall not find it and shall desire to die and death shall flee from them. So they are inflicted with this agony. Now that guy over in Revelation 6, death and hell, see, this, this thing just brings tremendous agony and destruction and persecution on everybody except those who are sealed with the seal of God. There is a remnant in the earth standing against these people that at this time God has sealed and protected. Now, this doesn't exactly match chapter 6, but I'm, I'm trying to get you to see the, the correlation between them. Uh, verse number 11 now. And they, these scorpions, had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon. But in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. <coughs> excuse me, Apollyon. Now, Apollyon and Abaddon, those two names mean the destroyer. And the bottomless pit has all of these hordes down there, and they have a king over them. And that king's name is Apollyon, or Abaddon, that is the destroyer. Come back with me, if you will, to Exodus chapter number 12. We've seen, we've seen a guy like this operate before. Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12. You know what the passage is. You know about the Exodus out of Egypt. You know how God told Israel to go out and slay the Passover lamb and put it on the doorpost because the death angel was going to pass through the night and everyone that didn't have the blood on the, on the lentils of the doorpost, what would happen? The firstborn child would be, would be killed. Exodus 12, 23. For the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians. And when he seeth the blood upon the lintel and on the two side posts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not suffer the destroyer to come in upon your houses to smite you. Now that word destroyer there is that word over there in Revelation 9 in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon. That's the word. It's the destroyer. The, the death angel we call him. Who's, who, is, who is it that the, has the power of death? You remember? Hebrews chapter number 2. Hebrews chapter 2. Somebody last week at, out at the conference, some folks were talking about, uh, uh, about does God have an appointed time when everybody will die? And, you know, and, and if God appointed a time when you were going to die, I guess they were talking about whether I should have died Sunday night or how come I stayed alive and that kind of stuff. Uh, it was basically the incompetence of the guy throwing the bomb. <laughs> That's how come I lived. But, uh, and it wasn't my brilliant reaction because when you look at the video and you see what I did, I ran to the guy instead of away from him. <laughs> wasn't real smart. You know, somebody said, what do you think you were doing? I didn't know. I was just, I said, get him. So I thought we all ought to get him. <laughs> No, it was over with by then. The reason I went to it, I mean, I just stood there and watched him throw it. I wasn't real heroic. You know, you got, if, if, if you'd have been bright when you saw a guy running at you with something flaming up about three feet, you'd duck behind, behind something. 
but I'm not that fast. I don't think quite fast enough to, to duck. So he'd already thrown the thing, and the reason I went over there to it was to kick the wick out of the way that had come out of the bottle. So that's, you know, just so you know, I wasn't being, uh, uh, I wasn't fixing to jump. I let the other guys jump on him. I didn't, I didn't uh, feel compelled to get involved in that. They took care of that. But uh, some, of that we had this, some of the folks were having a discussion about life and death. And uh, we were talking about it. One of the guys got real upset. He said, well, sure, God has an appointed time. And when God's appointed time for you to die comes, you, you, you die and you can't die before that. Well, I, I, don't, I don't believe that. I don't believe God set an appointed time. I don't think that every, I know that every detail of your life was not preordained and planned out by God. I mean, to say that's to say that every time you sin and every time you fail, God planned it. And that's, that's a terrible thing to say. But uh, one of the guys, he says, well, do you think you have the power of life and death? I said, well, I don't know about life, but I know about death. I know who has the power of death. You know who that is? Revelation 2, verse 14. For as much then as the children are protectors of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death. That is who? The devil. Folks, if there's anybody in, in this world going around killing people with the power of death, with the authority to administer death to people, that's who it is. You know where death came from? Death came by sin. And you know who brought sin into the universe? Satan did. It wasn't God's idea. You see, God had an eternal plan and purpose before the foundation of the world that he could have, taken, he could have brought into existence and, and accomplished had there never been any sin. God didn't need sin to accomplish his purpose. Now, he, he had a purpose planned, and if man sinned, he had a way to take care of that and put things back on track. And that's what we're involved in today in, re in redemption. But he didn't need our sin. I mean, if, if God is so little and so, uh, so limited that he needed your sin in order to glorify him, I mean, think of what you're saying about God. That's terrible, terrible thing to say about God. He glorifies himself in spite of our failure, but he doesn't have to have our failure to do it. Our sin doesn't exalt, doesn't push him. What it does is it manifests his grace and his goodness but to think he couldn't have done that without us, without our failure, is, is not, you know, that, that's saying something very, very unworthy of, of, of God himself. But it, the fact is, it's, it's like I tried to say to the people Sunday night, you can't worry about what didn't happen, it's what did happen. There are 50 jillion things that, you know, might not have happened. Let's thank God for what did happen and watch God's wisdom work in relationship to what does happen. Well, this guy has the power of death. Who has the power of death? Satan does. He has the power of death. Now, that doesn't mean every time somebody gets killed, Satan did it. It's just that the authority of de death is an enemy. And it, it's the product of sin. And this guy over here in Revelation is called death. He's the personification of that power. He's the one who comes along as the destroyer and, and, and goes out and, and his job is death. What this guy is all about is killing. It's death. It's destruction. And what's following him is hell. The personification again of hell. It's as if the inhabitants of hell are just belched up on the earth and follow after him and do his bidding. And that's exactly what happens there in Revelation chapter 9. And that's exactly who's, and what you're seeing in Revelation 6 is you're, you're, you're beginning to see the activities go on. And these things that are here are detailed for us in more detail later on in the book. So we'll be coming back here. But he, they, these guys go out and there's power given over the fourth part of the earth to kill with the sword and with hunger and with death and with be, the beast of the field. Now, when you think about somebody being killed with death, guys kill with the sword. Now, I understand that. They whack his head off. Another guy's killed with, with hunger, so you starve him to death. Well, the sword was back in verse 2, or the bow was back there, and the sword, uh, uh, verse 4, the sword, where they take peace from the earth. And then hunger's in verse 5 there, and 6, when the, when the famine comes. And with death and the beasts of the fields, well, there's the scorpions, and there's death in verse 8 there. The thing is that I, always, I read that and I think, the guy's going to kill with death. 
Like I said, I can understand killing with all these other things, but when you kill somebody with death, I mean, that's what you do is you, you death them. <laughs> How do you kill somebody with death? You, you know, I'm going to smite you with death. Well, what are you going to be? You're going to be dead. Well, I hit you with a sword, cut your head off, and I understand that. I do these other things to you, but that, that's a, a very peculiar expression when he talks about killing them with death. It's the kind of thing that, uh, that, that indicates that there is something about death, about the death here, that's special, a special kind of death. Look back at chapter 2, verse uh, 22 and 23. Talking about the church at Thyatira. 2.22, Behold, I will cast her into a bed. And them, talking about Jezebel, the, the idolatrous uh, a prophet, and them that commit adultery with her in a great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death. Well, that's, that's that same thing. Death follows. He kills them with death. It's a special kind of dying that's involved here. Now, these people are going to be killed by that, that plague that comes with the scourge connected with the Antichrist. Come back with me to Isaiah chapter 28. Death and hell follow. Isaiah 28. Here's a passage about the second coming of Christ and the tribulation. Isaiah 28 verse 14. Wherefore hear the word of the Lord, ye scornful men that rule this people which is in Jerusalem. Because ye have said, we have made a covenant with death, and with hell are we at agreement. When the overflowing scourge shall pass through, it shall not come upon us. This is what they say. For we have made lies our refuge, and under falsehood have we hid ourselves. These guys go out and make a covenant with the Antichrist, and they say, He's going to protect us. He's going to save us. And when the, when, when the enemy tries to come down here and destroy us, we are going to be protected because we have a league with death and a, and a covenant with hell. We've got this agreement with the Antichrist. See how the Antichrist is identified back here as, as the covenant with death and with hell we're in agreement? They made a covenant with this man who, whose name is death. And they're in agreement with the satanic program that is, is carried on by, uh, in, in hell. Verse 16, Therefore thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. Now that's an interesting verse. In the New Testament that verse is quoted and it says, He that believeth shall not be ashamed. But back here it says, He that believeth shall not make haste. You remember that verse in Luke chapter 21 when Christ is talking about seeing Jerusalem compassed about and all this stuff? And he says, In your patience you shall possess your souls. These people in the tribulation have to wait. They have to wait on the Lord. You know the verse that says in Isaiah about they that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength and all that? Wait on the Lord. Waiting. That's not like us waiting. That's these people are in that tribulation and they can't buy, they can't sell, they're being persecuted, they're being destroyed, people, some of their, their cohorts are being killed. They may have to go lay down their life on an altar of sacrifice before the worship of the Antichrist. And all that time he says, don't get antsy. He that believes shall not make haste. Just take your time. Don't get all, don't get all excited. Don't get all worked up. Just wait. Uh, because the Lord's waiting. Now I want you to remember that because when we get over in, in Revelation 6 in a minute, you're going to see some people saying, how long do we have to wait? Waiting is an issue in the tribulation for these saints. In Isaiah 30 verse 18 it says, Therefore will the Lord wait that He may be gracious unto you, and therefore will He be exalted that He may have mercy upon you, for the Lord is, is a God of judgment. Blessed are they that wait for Him. For the people shall dwell in Zion at Jerusalem. They shall weep no more. He will be very gracious unto thee at the voice of thy crying. When He shall hear it, He will answer. And though the Lord give you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, yet shall not thy uh, teachers be removed into a corner any more, but thine, uh, thine eyes shall see thy teacher. I mean, he says, I will deliver you. But you're going to have to wait 
till it's my time to do it. Say you got started in the, in the, in the seventh week of Daniel. That's where we're at in Revelation 6. The seventh week's going. How long is it going to last? Seven years. If you're two years and six months into it, how much more time you got to go? Five and a half years. You know what? You got to wait. If you're under that kind of persecution and knowing you've got to wait to the end, he that endures to the end shall be saved is the message there. They have to wait, patiently wait. Over there in Revelation we'll see passages where it says, here is the patience of the saints. That patient enduring. You remember when we went through chapter 2 and 3, those churches over and over again it talked about patience, patiently waiting, patiently enduring. That's what's going on here. Revelation 28 verse 17, judgment also will I lay to the line, and righteousness to the plummet. And the hail shall sweep away the refuge of lies. Now the refuge of lies is that thing in verse 15, the, the covenant with death and the agreement with hell. And water shall overflow the hiding place. And your covenant with death shall be disannulled. And your agreement with hell shall not stand when the overflowing scourge shall pass through, then you shall be trodden down by it. Now that overflowing scourge, that's the second advent of Jesus Christ. That's Him coming back and destroying the, the Antichrist and all those associated with Him. Verse 19, For the time that it goeth forth, it shall take you. From morning by morning shall it pass by, by day and by night, and it shall be a vexation only to understand the report. He's describing what these lost associates with the Antichrist are going to be thinking when they're getting their reports about Jesus Christ coming back. Now as we get through Revelation, we're going to see some passages that, that describe the, 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 the route that he takes. He comes down, starts up in the northern part uh, of, of Palestine, up around Damascus, and he comes down the sea coast, down through the Gaza Strip, down into the Sinai Peninsula across the, 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 the eastern side of, uh, of, of uh, Edom and comes up the eastern side uh, of, the sea of, uh, of the Dead Sea up through the eastern side of the Jordan River and crosses over the Jordan River into Jerusalem going from the east to the west. All of that battle that takes place, there will be a tremendous artillery battle, a tremendous air battle, tremendous fighting and carrying on where the Lord walks through the wine press of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God as He destroys the Antichrist and all the armies of the nations that have been gathered together against the Lord to fight against Him. And that battle as it goes on and as, it, as it's progressing and they get the reports, what you're reading in verse 19 is He's saying, look, you guys in Jerusalem that are trusting in the Antichrist that have made this covenant and you're hanging on and you think, you, when you, you're going to find out that when I come in and I, I bring my, the armies of heaven and we fight against you, here, this is how you, you're going to hear this thing and you, it's going to be a vexation just to hear the news. You know, CNN will be on the house stop saying the scud fell over there, you know, all that kind of stuff. It won't be scuds, but it'll be, I'll show you here in a minute when we get down the passage, it'll be some kind of artillery going on here. Verse 20, For the bed is shorter than, than that a man can stretch himself on it, and the covering narrower than he that can, that can wrap himself in it. That is, you ever heard the expression, you've made your bed lie in it? And he said, you made a bed, but buddy, the bed doesn't fit. You said you're going to do something, but you're not going to be able to do it. For the Lord, verse 21, shall rise up, as in the mount, as in Mount Perizim, he's going to rise up. You remember Acts chapter seven, how Stephen saw him. Are y'all with me? You know where the power. I'm sorry. We're in Isaiah 28 verse 21. You know that. Did I? I'm sorry. There's not 28 chapters in Revelation, so immediately you knew we was wrong, I was wrong, didn't you? Isaiah 28, that, we're going to read down to the, to the end of the chapter, so. I'm, I'm tired, my mind's kind of foggy because you're mine. <laughs> Verse 21, the Lord shall rise up. You remember Acts 8, uh, Acts 7 rather with Stephen, he's standing. And you know, we, make, we, we try to explain to you about how he sat down at, at, in Acts 2. Peter says, he's sitting, sit thou at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Here he is, he's gotten up. What did, what's he get up to do? He rises up. Why? 
He rises up as in Mount Perazim. He shall be wroth, wrath, angry, as in the valley of Gibeon, that he may do his work, his strange work, and bring to pass his act, his strange act. Now therefore be ye not mockers, lest your bands be made strong. For I have heard from the Lord God of hosts a consumption, even, uh, even determined upon the whole earth. The second coming of Christ is going to be like two things in the passage. Like he rose up in Mount Perazim. That's in 2 Samuel chapter 5. When David went out to fight, and the Lord says, you go out there to fight, but you don't go till you hear the goings and the tops of the mulberry trees. And when you hear that thing fly over there, then you just follow it. Watch what it does. Now that's strange. You know, you read that and say, what in the world? You read it here. You say, why is that back there? You read it here and God says, you remember how I fought back over there in Mount Perazim with that thing flying over David and protecting him and destroying the enemy? That's what I'm going to do when I come back again. It's amazing, folks, when you study the prophets, how often, in fact, all of the book of Exodus and Numbers is just a dress rehearsal for the second advent of Jesus Christ. And I'll tell you, it's one of the most frustrating things in all the world to see people teach, you know, Exodus like it's all past, just a storybook about what happened back there. Over and over and over again, when God wants to describe to you what the second coming and the tribulation is going to be like, He goes back, He says, you remember what it was back there? What he says in verse 20, remember what it's like back in 2 Samuel chapter 5? It's going to be like that over there. He should be wroth as in the day of Gibeon. That's Joshua chapter 10. When the sun stood still and all that stuff. And God fights for Israel back there. He says over here, it's going to be like it was back over there. So if you want to read what it's going to be like over in the tribulation... And at the second advent, you can go back and take those passages because they're types, they're pictures. Now verse 23, Give ye ear, and hear my voice. Hearken, and hear my speech. Doth the plowman plow all day to sow? Doth he open and break the clods of, of his ground? When he hath made plain the face thereof, doth he not cast abroad the fitches, and scatter the, the cunum, and, and cast in the principal wheat? Of the, of the appoint, and the appointed barley and the rye in their place. In other words, doesn't he go out and get the weeds out and put the good stuff in? For his God doth instruct him to discretion and doth teach him. For the fitches are not threshed with the threshing instrument, neither is a cart wheel turned about upon the cumin, but the fitches are beaten out with a staff and the cumin with the rod. In other words, you separate out the different kind of things and one thing you harvest in one way, and one way you harvest in another way. You remember in Matthew chapter 3 when John the Baptist says, uh, there's one coming after me who's mightier than I, whose shoes I'm not worthy to bear. He'll ba I baptize you with water, but he, he that cometh after me will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor, gather the wheat into the garner, the kingdom, and burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. That's the, this is the figure of speech that they're talking about here. Verse 28, bread corn is bruised because he will not ever be threshing it, nor break it with the wheel of his cart, nor bruise it with his horsemen. This also cometh forth from the Lord of hosts, which, which is wonderful in counsel and excellent in working. Now, you know, I've studied that passage for years trying to figure that thing out. I understand what he's saying. But you try to think, why is he saying it this way? And what he's saying there is that there, you, you harvest different kind of things in different kind of ways. Joel chapter 3, Revelation chapter 14, the second advent of Christ is described as, the, as a harvest. And there are three different kinds of, of instruments that he's using here in the harvest. There's the threshing instrument, there's the wheel of the cart, the cart that goes around and squashes things, and then there's the horseman. And that's some, that, that gives you some idea of, of the different kind of, of you're having the air show downtown today and you see all that different artillery. Somebody was telling me when I came in, Art was telling me about going down and seeing the stealth bomber, you know. That's a weird looking thing as it flies by, you know, them wings all swept back and then it'll do them out like that and all that. It doesn't look like a regular airplane like, you know, what we're familiar with. 
then you see all the, the helicopters and this thing and that thing. And, and, you know, one of those helicopters that they use, uh, those attack helicopters, we've got some mosquitoes out at my house that look about like that. <laughs> and I say, who there's one of them, you know, and it looks just like it. And I, I'm amazed at some of the way they've, you know, I don't know if they study the, the insect creation to try to figure out how to aerodynamically do things. It'd probably be a good idea if they did. But uh, that's what's going on there is those different kind of, of artilleries, different kind of flying, and the Lord is going to come with an air force, an army out of heaven, and they're going to come down and they're going to pass over. He says in Isaiah 31, pass, uh, as, as the birds fly, so will I save Jeru deliver Jerusalem, and passing over, I'll deliver it. And he doesn't hit the ground until he t steps off the horse on, Mount of on the Mount of Olives. But he has all this stuff coming with him. Now, go back with me to Revelation chapter 6. That thing in Isaiah 28, see they're fighting against death and hell. They they've made this covenant with death and with hell they're in agreement. They've made a covenant with the Antichrist and they're in agreement with the, with the plot that's hatched, it, hatched out by hell, a way of saying the satanic policy, against what God's doing. Now verse number 9, Revelation 6, 9, when he had opened the fifth seal, now the four horsemen are over now. The career of the Antichrist and the destruction and all has been described, the result of it. When, I, when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them, and, they, and it was said unto them that they should, should rest yet a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren should be killed as they were, should be fulfilled. Now we want to study that in some detail next time, but I want you to see just basically tonight in verse 10 and, and 9 and 10, these, these are people who hold a testimony during the tribulation. They're that little flock, that believing remnant that's, that's testifying and holding out and, and holding out the witness against the Antichrist and for God's, God's truth. And their question is exactly the question in Isaiah 28. He that believeth shall not make haste. They say, how long is this thing going to go on? In other words, they're, they're, they're already dead. And their souls are under the altar uh, of God. And they're there in New Jerusalem. And they're saying, how long is this going to be? How long is this going to be? And God says to them, well, just be patient. Just be patient. Just be patient. I mean, the, the judgment is so traumatic. Come back with me one passage, Psalm 79. You'll go back through the, the Old Testament, especially the Psalms, and over and over again you'll see this cry about how long. And when you run into that, remember that what that is prophetically is that guy in that tribulation saying how long. There are three times in the earthly ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ that he was on his way to do something. And while he was on the way, something happened that interrupted him and delayed his going. When he delayed his going, the thing that delayed him caused what he was initially going to do to, to happen. People died. Each one of the time he was going to heal somebody, going to save them from death or something like that. And uh, somebody would come into his way, something would happen, he would delay, and the result is the person would die. Tragedy would come in. Lazarus, for example, the, uh, the widow's son, for example, uh, 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 the, the Jairus' daughter, rather, for example. And he delayed. He would delay to do something, then he would go and eventually do what he intended to do. And, the thing, that, and all that's teaching these people that, there's, that, that there are things that have to be accomplished before that consummation comes. Revelation 79. Now this is a Psalm 79. You knew that anyway though, didn't you? This is a, a passage, a psalm about the second coming of Christ. Uh, 
what you read, when you read this psalm, you're reading a Jew in the tribulation praying for the second coming. That's basically what he's doing. By the way, the book of Psalms, I understand people use it as a, as a song book and a, and a prayer book and all that because it enters into the sufferings of men. But the book of Psalms is basically the prayer book of a saint in the tribulation period. And over and over and over and over, and I, I, don't, I couldn't even tell you tonight how many of them. I, I've studied through the Psalms for years and have them marked uh, in places where the reference is to the second coming of Christ. And every one of these Psalms right along in here, uh, Psalm 77, Psalm 78, Psalm 79, Psalm 80, Psalm 82, Psalm 83, Psalm 84, Psalm, all these things have to do with details about a, a, a saint in the tribulation looking out and responding and, and God responding to him. Notice how this works, Psalm 79. O oh God, the heathen are come into thine inheritance. They, they, these idol worshipers have come in and taken over Israel. They set up their idols. The idol shepherd, the IDOL, the, the idolatrous system has been set up. He that have come in to thine inheritance, thy holy temple have they defiled. They have laid Jerusalem on heaps. The dead bodies of thy servants have they given to be meat under the fowls of heaven, the flesh of thy servants under the beast of the earth. Just like in Revelation we just read where they're, they're going to be destroyed with the beast. Their blood have they shed like water round about Jerusalem, and there is none to bury them. We are become a reproach to our neighbors, a scorn and derision to them that are round about us. How long, Lord, wilt thou be angry for, uh, uh, forever? Shall thy jealousy burn like, like fire? Pour out thy wrath upon the heathen that, that have not known thee and upon the kingdoms that have not called upon thy name, for they have devoured Jacob and laid waste thy dwelling place. Oh, remember not, uh, against us former iniquities. Let thy tender mercy speedily prevent us, for we are brought very low. Help us, O Lord of our, O God of our salvation, for the glory of thy name, and deliver us and purge away our sins for thy name's sake. Wherefore shall the heathen say, Where is their God? Let him be known among the heathen in, in our sight by the revenging of the blood of thy servants which is shed. That's one of those imprecatory statements in the Psalms that people have such trouble with. Let the sighing of the prisoner come before thee according to the, the greatness of thy power. Preserve thou those that are appointed to death and render unto our neighbors sevenfold into their bosom their, their reproach wherewith they have reproached thee, O Lord. So we thy people and the, uh, the sheep of thy pasture will give thee thanks forever we will show, thy, show forth thy praise to all generations. So there's that Jew just persecuted and beat down, and he says, Lord, are you going to be mad at us forever and let all this happen, or are you going to get up and come do something about it? And the book of Revelation says he's going to get up and come do something about it. Uh, one of the brothers was showing me a, 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 a placard the other day, a, a, a bumper sticker, and it had, a, it had a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ on a big white charger, Reared up and coming. And uh, the sign on it said, Guess who's coming back? And boy, is he mad. <laughs> and that's, that's where that's going to be. And he won't wait forever. But for these people in that tribulation, they got to wait till he does come. And that's where we are in that passage. And we'll study some of those people in detail. I want you to be sure to see who they are and why they die and how they die next time. All right. It's been a long week, hasn't it? And uh, it's a good, good way to end the, end, end the day. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you this, this evening for your goodness, your grace to us. We thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for the hope that we have that one day this world will be set right the Lord Jesus Christ to be honored, glorified like He ought to be. And we know that right now you're holding back the wrath in order to pour out your grace. We thank you for that. We don't have to cry, how long? How long do you let the world suffer and under the heat? Because we know that you're doing something very special today. In fact, our heart, if anything, would desire it to continue. 
so that others too might come to rejoice in the grace that's ours in Christ. But we know we leave those things in your hands. They're not ours to determine and ours to decide. We just take our life day by day as, as, as a gift from Thee and as an opportunity to serve Thee and to be used of Thee. Heavenly Father, we're grateful for our salvation. We're grateful that, that we can be saved by grace and just stand complete in Christ. And yet, You also give us the, the opportunity and the privilege of service. And we pray that as we take up that opportunity, that our dedication and our consecration might be that to, to such a, an extent that would be faithful to the task and the opportunity, knowing that what we're doing is not what we're doing really, but it's what you're doing in us for your own self. We pray as we study through this passage, you'd bless it to our hearts and encourage us to, to see the intricacies of your word but also to rejoice in the fact that, that your word is, you, you figured, you, you've planned it, you've detailed it, you'll do it. And if you'll do it for Israel and, and the prophetic program, you certainly will do it for us. May our confidence be in that. We pray and ask it in Christ.